Hello and welcome to this session on textiles in Armenian manuscripts as part of the book and the Silk Roads Textiles in Manuscripts Workshop. I'm Brian Keane, a professor of art history at Riverside City College and previously a curator of manuscripts at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. I'd like to allow my co-discussants to introduce themselves this morning. Hi, I'm Harai Hok Khacherian, independent uh, professional photographer uh, residing in uh, Montreal, Canada, and traveling all over the world uh, to capture Armenian heritage uh, from churches to manuscripts uh, and publishing books. And hello, I'm Sylvie Marion, and I'm a reader services librarian at the Morgan Library and Museum, but my passion is my work on Armenian manuscripts and bindings. We're thrilled to be here today, and we wanted to begin by acknowledging that the land, water, air, and natural resources around our homes and workplaces in what is now called Montreal, New York, and Los Angeles across Turtle Island are the traditional and ancestral territories of the Mohawk and Haudenosaunee, of the Lenape, and of the Tongva and numerous other indigenous communities whose presence here stretches back in time immemorial and remains vibrant today. We offer our gratitude and commit to living in harmony with our environment and the peoples around us. We felt that it was important to begin with a land acknowledgement like this one, because our conversation about historic Armenia and the Armenian diaspora will take us to many places across Eurasia. And so the theme of our presence as settlers on this land in North America will be with me as I think through these conversations today. And with that, I'd like to turn the conversation over to Dr. Marion. Sylvie, if you could give us a brief overview then by looking at this map about the Armenian peoples, their homeland, and their movements across these spaces. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I wanted to show this map because it shows uh, different periods of time uh, of, of the Armenian homeland, the current uh, Republic of Armenia, other um, kingdoms that existed. Uh, as you see here, the Armenian traditional Armenian homeland is considered approximately this area outlined in blue. Um, there were various kingdoms, uh, as you see, the, the brown area from it was the Armenian Empire of Tigran the Great in 70 BC. And we have the last Armenian kingdom of Cilicia uh, with the brown stripes in, on the lower Mediterranean. Cilicia was very important because of its important connections with Europe. Um, and it was where crusaders came down to go to Jerusalem. Uh, the current Republic of Armenia is the area of orange stripes, as we see above. Um, uh, a few parts that I want you to pay attention to, uh, because we will be talking about it, is Lake Van in the center. This is the area of Vasburagan. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about that. Also, I'll be mentioning Tokat, uh, a, a city which is between um, it's southwest of Trebizond, as you see on the uh, Black Sea. And uh, another important town we're going to talk about is Diyarbakir, which is between Lake Van and Malatya. It's not on this map. Both of those uh, regions and cities were, uh, had important Armenian communities, uh, and they were very important for um, the production and uh, industry of cotton and printing cotton uh, with designs, as we will see very soon, uh, a lot of those. Okay. And so our conversation today will take us from Anatolia and Western Asia. You can see the Tigris and the Euphrates uh, in present day Iraq, and we'll move even further into Iran and in parts of India later in our conversation. We've been fortunate in looking at Armenian manuscripts with textiles to have incredible examples of objects in the Morgan Library, as well as at the Getty Museum, the Metropolitan Museum and elsewhere, but we're most grateful uh, to the work of our colleague Hawk here. And so Hawk, I wonder if you can tell us about your many book projects and specifically this one about Armenian block printed fabric. Uh, indeed, uh, this uh, book is actually uh, one of the books that we published with Armin Kirtian, uh, who's the designer of this book, and I was the photographer. Uh, the first book was Armenian uh, ornamental uh, art, which is uh, the black version. And then we had the Armenian ornamental script, which uh, were um, basically the Armenian alphabet taken from thousands of uh, Armenian manuscripts 
today, those manuscripts are, uh, um, you can uh, see them, you can photograph them at uh, different places, uh, mostly in North America, but the majority are at the Matena Taran in uh, Armenia, uh, where they have approximately 14,000 manuscripts uh, deposited there. And uh, also at uh, San Lazzaro in Italy, uh, the Mechitarist uh, congregation, the Armenian Mechitarist also in uh, Vienna, and also the very important uh, depository that we have at the St. James uh, Armenian uh, Monastery in uh, Jerusalem. So I've been going around and photographing uh, thousands of manuscripts with great difficulty, as uh, Sylvie Merian knows, uh, they're not uh, accessible to all, and uh, as an independent photographer, publisher, it's even harder because I'm not supported by universities or uh, other institutions. So throughout the 30 uh, years or so, I was able to photograph these manuscripts and uh, publish them in these uh, magnificent books that you can see. This is only a partial uh, work that I have uh, from my archives, which uh, is about a million uh, photographs of uh, different Armenian manuscripts and churches and uh, monasteries, uh, artifacts, etc. And Hawk, something that has impressed me and that we've talked about is that as a professional photographer, you in fact have one of the greatest art historical eyes because you are able to see the patterns in these textiles and their relationship to uh, ornamental architecture and decorative patterns in manuscripts, decorative patterns in, in paintings, in churches. And that to me is one of the great themes that will come across today, I think in our discussion, are the ways in which these patterns were important in the books themselves, in uh, the liturgical vestments and other contexts. So I hope that you'll also chime in as Sylvie and I are going back and forth about where else you've noticed these patterns. And so with that, sure. Sylvie, can you tell us something about the contexts for textiles in Armenia? books. Yes, this uh, next slide I decided to do a kind of pastiche to show the different contexts in which these textiles were used. Uh, of course, the most important one in manuscripts are the cloth doublures, which line the, the boards and hide the um, board attachment uh, of the manuscript. So I have a couple examples here. Um, on the upper right, this is an unusual one. This is a, some, a kind of a silk brocade. Uh, I have sent this to our textile experts, but I, uh, this one I haven't gotten an answer on yet. Um, it, one of them did mention that it might possibly be European, but we're not sure about that. It, it could be uh, local production. It could be Damascus. Uh, I think in Syria, they were known for doing brocades. Um, of course, many of them are these stamped block printed stamped um, fabrics, uh, which we see a couple examples here. Um, there are many different kinds. Hawk's book has hundreds of them and, and thank God for Hawk because he's, he's just doing the great, a great, great job. Um, uh, so we see two examples here and I'm gonna show some more later. Another way they textiles were used was sometimes as pouches to store a, a, a sacred manuscript. And these were used to both protect and honor the manuscripts um, and may have been a kind of a votive offering too. As you see in the upper right, this is uh, one from the Morgan Library. I'll discuss it further later. And on the far right, uh, I just wanted to show an example of another use for these costs was in the construction of the manuscript. In the actual binding, they would cover the spine with a plain uh, tabby weave, not, I've never seen one that was decorated. It's usually hidden by the spine leather, but in this case, it is um, the, the spine leather is damaged and gone. So it then enables us to see uh, how this was done. Okay, and uh, lower left and middle, we see another manuscript from the Morgan, which is a very unusual manuscript, which I'll discuss uh, at the end, but it, it had about, um, I think, 25 cloth inserts of which eight of them were pieces of embroidery, pieces of cut embroidery. 
I think these were probably votive offerings, and I'll explain that further later. There's also, you see the red in the middle of the far left image. That's a silk bookmark. So they had uses like that too. Then we see yet another very beautiful uh, stamped um, uh, cloth from a man. Uh, it's actually a printed book bound in the same way as the manuscript, also in San Lazzaro in Venice, uh, Italy at the Mechitaris congregation. And another small thing that was done very often, especially in a gospel book, a priest might need to refer to certain passages frequently. And he would put a kind of bookmark where he would sew um, uh, threads through the page, as you see here, the blue threads. But before doing that, they would reinforce it with a piece of cloth or um, sometimes a piece of paper, sometimes a fancy piece of paper, but more often a scrap of cloth like this, which reinforced the, the page, which was usually paper. Um, and yes, the other thing about the printed textiles, these were probably or possibly Indian printed imports from India, or they also could have been locally produced. Uh, it was cheaper to locally produce them. And um, sometimes they're in direct imitation of these Indian uh, printed fabrics. So that's, that's something that is very difficult to sort out. We may not be able to sort it out, but we should keep in mind that uh, there was cotton production in, um, in the Ottoman Empire, and they did make these printed fabrics also in addition to Indian imports. And I think beyond the pages of books then, another theme that we talked about are the presence of textile patterns simulated in the illuminations within the manuscripts that relate to actual textile patterns. And this is a theme that came across in Helen Evans' great exhibition, Armenia, Art, Religion, and Trade in the Middle Ages uh, in 2018 and 19. And here we see two images of the same individual, Archbishop John, in his earlier years and then later years in life a page from the Morgan Library in which we see the Archbishop wearing this fleur de lise cope that can relate to contemporaneous 13th century production of silks in France, the kingdom of Louis IX, or possibly the Angevin court of Naples, Sicily, and Jerusalem. These courts were connected through various uh, political and marital relationships. We see Archbishop John there at lower right in the Morgan Library image presenting Marshall Ocean with his two sons. And these individuals had a relationship. We have um, Archbishop John as being the uh, half brother of King Hetram I and then Marshall Ocean being the uncle to Queen Karen. So this uh, familial relationship. And then later, in life, we see Archbishop John again in this manuscript from the Matanadaran, where the lower portion of the garment features a swirling dragon. And what I loved in the exhibition at the Met was the presentation of that book alongside a roughly contemporaneous East Asian silk showing a similar dragon pattern. And so with these two examples alone, we're able to see the ways in which the Armenian community and Armenians themselves were at that crossroads of Eurasia with westernmost examples connecting us to the French court and easternmost connections across the Silk Roads leading us to China and beyond. And there were a number of examples in that exhibition and in scholarship that has come out of this exhibition as a specialist on Italian manuscripts, I became interested in those books made for Armenian communities in Italy that featured illuminations by Italian artists and the patterns of textiles there that relate to surviving textiles in church treasuries. So that's a topic for another day. But one of the themes that Sylvie, you and Hawk immediately noticed were the repeated patterns that appear in multiple manuscripts. And I think that's where we'll go for the next few moments. Yes. So when I was doing my dissertation research, I spent a lot of time in Venice at San Lazzaro at the, at the uh, monastery, the collection there. And um, that was where I did most of my research. And on the left, you see uh, two images from manuscript 1351. This manuscript was copied in uh, New Jolfa. Uh, we, I forgot to explain that with the map, but um, in 1604, uh, Shah Abbas of Iran uh, deported Armenians from the old, old town of Jolfa and other towns to his capital of Isfahan. He gave them land across the river from Isfahan, which they uh, 
populated and called Nujofa. Many of these Armenians were very uh, wealthy merchants who had contacts with Europe. Um, in any case, there was a, it was a wealthy community. They copied a lot of manuscripts, even at this late date, they built a lot of churches. So um, this binding had these, this striped fabric and uh, you know, it was nice. And it's a, we know that this manuscript was copied in 1694 to 95 in Isfahan. And the binding is dated 1695 because there's an inscription stamped on the binding uh, telling us that. So, um, okay, very nice. A few years later, I'm in Philadelphia. You see on the left, I open this gospel book. I see the same fabric and I was kind of floored. Um, this manuscript was copied in 1504 in Sanahin, which is in the region of Lori in Northern Armenia. And clearly this, at some point, it, it's a rebound manuscript that I could see immediately. Um, and it had made its way sometime between 1504 and the 1690s to Nujolfa, got repaired and rebound. And it was clearly done in the same workshop um, because they're using the same piece of fabric. So uh, I've now since learned this is not uncommon and Hawk's book really showed because he showed a lot of uh, examples with similar cloth in different manuscripts and completely different collections. Okay, next. Oh, and one other thing, this is, sorry, if we can go back. Uh, this, I had the textile experts, uh, Rosemary Krill look at this and she thinks this is probably a, a fabric that's local production from Isfahan, okay. This is another manuscript on the left, also at San Lanzaro, also from New Jolfa. Um, it's a ritual book copied between 1704 and 1709. The scribe is very clear. It gives us the exact date he started it, the exact date he finished it. And um, his name was Hachadur. He was a married priest. He was the scribe, the artist, the binder, and the patron of the manuscript. I found a very similar textile, not exactly the same, in one of Hawke's um, data sets, uh, as you see on the left. I have not seen, excuse me, on the right, I have not seen that manuscript. Uh, it's in the Matanadaran, but it's very similar. And the uh, textile experts said, for, they said the one on the left is Persian 18th century. So again, probably local production. And um, on the right is probably Persian 18th century also. And I forgot to say, I think that the, um, the manuscript on the left, again, is an inscribed binding with the date and all the information, you know, saying I bound this in the year 1710, et cetera. Okay. And that was something that we thought about as well, Sivi, in looking at Hawk's data set is it was so remarkable how many of these manuscripts included colophons and really detailed information about their production, but also the binding. And so that, yes. you know, Hawk, I wonder if, if you have a sense of how many, what percentage of the books had such detailed information in terms of their bindings specifically. Uh, well, uh, photographing almost uh, 1,200 uh, manuscripts uh, only in Armenia, in Matenataram, for this project, uh, I would say uh, roughly 10% were uh, duplicates, uh, but the rest were uh, very unique. And some of them had actually three or four different uh, layers or even three or four different parts of uh, uh, block printed fabrics attached to each other. So depending on what they had and uh, what kind of uh, work they did. So they used whatever they, they had uh, in stock or uh, in hand. But what's okay. really interesting also is uh, for uh, to photograph all this, uh, you have to have a very good lighting system and permission, first of all. And uh, to find all these manuscripts uh, from the 14,000 uh, manuscripts, you have to know exactly which ones to photograph because some of them, uh, they have just different uh, or simple cloth on them and they're uh, worth uh, only photographing a couple of them just for, uh, you know, to, to make, um, the, to see the difference between the printed and non-printed fabric. Uh, and also, as you mentioned, uh, uh, the exhibition of uh, at the Metropolitan Museum was uh, very well done. And I was hired as a photographer for the catalog. And also I would like to uh, add that as a photographer, uh, 
uh, we see a lot of details and uh, sometimes uh, we have to remember which uh, photograph was taken where and which manuscript is similar to what because they're uh, in different uh, locations like uh, Lebanon, Syria, Jerusalem, uh, Yerevan, uh, Italy, Venice, etc. And in one of the books that uh, Sylvie published uh, with uh, uh, the, the Legacy of the Armenian Treasures uh, with the Alex and Mary Manukian Museum, you remember, Sylvie, that you had uh, one uh, manuscript which is very interesting, and we couldn't uh, you couldn't tell uh, who uh, specifically was the author of uh, the illumination. And uh, I had found a similar manuscript at Madena Taran with the dates and the name of uh, the scribe. So that uh, uh, gave us an idea exactly who was the copier. So as a photographer, it's very important to notice these things. In, with uh, thousands of manuscripts, uh, you have to have the eye and uh, the professionalism in order to uh, put them side by side. Yes, uh, I did. I wanted to make one comment about colophons and the uh, dated bindings. So, in the Armenian tradition, it's very, very normal to have a written colophon at the end of the manuscript, unless it's been damaged and and the last few pages are missing. And if you're lucky, it'll tell you on this. You know, I. I copied this, uh, so-and-so was the artist, pray for him, uh, and of course, pray for the wonderful patron, and so-and-so bound it, or I copied and I bound it, or something like that. But a dated binding uh, with a stamp date and, and inscription on it seems to be a native to New Julfa. They, the ones I've seen are only from there. They're very distinctive uh, uh, tooling, and um, so uh, an actual dated binding really being very specific on the binding itself is a new Julfa phenomenon from about the 17th century to early 18th century. And I think you have a story for us that will take us from this manuscript yes. uh, at San Lazaro there. So let's hear this incredible story that you've okay. told for us. This is, this is very, so the paper for this manuscript is paper from the Veneto. Uh, it, it, we know this because of the watermarks. It's uh, called Tre Lune, which is three crescent moons. Um, and this uh, paper was made and much of it was exported eastward. So this paper ended up in New Julfa. Our, our scribe, artist, binder, and patron, Hachadur, the priest, uh, a married priest, as I said, he used uh, this uh, Tre Lune paper to copy his ritual book. And um, produce his manuscript. And as you see, here's an example of an illumination from the manuscript. And then um, he bound the manuscript using the Persian textile, as we saw. So uh, this is in 1710 when the manuscript is bound. At some point, we don't know when, but between 1710 and 1820, in that 100 years, the manuscript ends up in Madras, India. Now, a lot of Armenians from New Jolfa at some point in the 17th, 18th century had immigrated to, um, uh, had gone to uh, India for trade reasons and uh, to continue their businesses. And this manuscript, I think perhaps it was a descendant of Hachadur, the priest. Um, she was not uh, uh, married to a priest. Uh, but anyway, the manuscript was owned by a woman whose name was uh, Digin, which is like Madame Digin Anna Muradian. And two uh, Armenian Catholic priests from the Mechitaris Monastery of San Lazaro are in Madras. She donates it to them in her memory and in memory of her deceased husband. And the manuscript ends up going back to Venice where the paper was originally made. So that's a whole circle uh, Venice, New Julfa, Madras, and back to Venice. And that global network then is similar to the peripatetic lives and histories of the Armenian peoples. That was a subject 
that I became fascinated with in the 2016 exhibition at the Getty, Traversing the Globe Through Illuminated Manuscripts, which uh, Sylvie and Susan Akbari, who was one of the organizers of the conference, were able to see and speak at and publish in a volume. And there I was interested in all the many contexts in which textiles appeared uh, in, in a Byzantine manuscript from the Getty's collection from the 13th century with indigo dyed silk veils and showing that manuscript alongside a 15th century Gujarati manuscript from India made for a Jain community, the Kalpa Sutra text with its own uh, fabric um, veils, some of which were solid colors, yellow and red as we see, or striped patterns showing those alongside uh, Armenian manuscripts from New Jolfa, like the upper right, which we'll show in a moment, with the silk doubleurs, as well as a 16th century Ethiopian manuscript from the monastery of Gundagunde, with its own stamped textiles, possibly from India, and then thinking about other uh, kinds of painted or woven textiles. So that long cotton scroll from India is a wonderful example of Hindu painting about the life of Manavinayaka, one of these um, avatars of Ganesha. And we know more about Hindu painting from these scrolls that survive than manuscripts. And in the same time, showing just two other textile examples, an Ottoman patterned uh, velvet that became a Venetian chasuble in the 15th century. And then the mercantile uh, nautical scene of both Western and Eastern ship types in the upper uh, right uh, that was woven either in Iran or India, um, possibly involving Armenian merchants there. And so that theme that takes us far beyond the pages of the book, far beyond the Armenian homelands to the many different communities that they had come into contact with. And with that, I think I can turn it back to you, Sylvie, to think about manuscripts with veils and with these patterned bindings. So this is another example. Also, it happens to be at San Lazaro in their collection. It's Manuscript Cordion 33. Uh, this is a gospel book by Zakaria Avansi. Uh, and it was copied 1596-97 in the Lake Vaughan area. I did not see any evidence of rebinding. It could have been rebound and I'm, it was so well rebound that I didn't notice it, but I don't think it was rebound. Um, and it has a cloth doublure, which uh, might be Indian 18th century. Now that would kind of indicate some kind of major repair or uh, rebinding, but another possibility is it could have been from Diyarbakir, where they made some similar types of um, cloth de blures, uh, uh, sorry, of printed cloth. Um, and uh, yes, and I did forget, I wanted to show, I don't know if you'll see this, these stamps, I bought these in a um, museum gift shop years ago. And these are the type of stamps that would have been used for printing fabrics. I hope you can see that. I don't see myself, so I hope it's good. Um, the other thing about this manuscript is that it had a couple uh, cloth curtains or veils. Um, it's not very common in Armenian manuscripts. Of course, they could be lost. Uh, and I've seen only two. This is one example. Um, and this was not sewn to the paper, but it was probably glued. As you see on the left side of the illumination of the deposition of Christ, there's a dark um, residue, which I think is glue or paste that this uh, curtain used to be attached to. Um, and it's probably silk. I don't know where that would have exactly come from, but um, it, it appeared to be silk to me. And then we have this great example, which has blown my mind because it's so similar to the kinds of uh, wrapped uh, bindings or carrying pouches, rather, that we see mm. in so many Western European examples. Yes. So this is a, a wonderful example at the Morgan. The manuscript itself is a gospel book on parchment from the mid 17th century from Constantinople. Very professionally done. And it has this gilt silver uh, covers made for it, uh, custom made for it probably 17th, 18th century. I'm not sure about that. But in addition, it, come, it came with this wonderful, beautiful embroidered pouch. The embroidery is typical of the Lake Vaughan area. I don't know the date of the pouch. It's in very good condition. It could perhaps be as early as the late 17th century. 
to the early 20th century, but I think most likely it's probably 19th to early 20th century. I'd like to have our um, embroidery experts uh, look at this and see if they have any ideas about it. But it is typical of uh, the Lake Vaughan area. So from Lake Vaughan to Constantinople, somehow this was made for it. It's, as you see, it's a square that's been folded over um, three times and sewn together. Um, and uh, yes, and this was done basically to protect this precious sacred uh, manuscript. And I think also to honor it and perhaps even be a votive offering from the person who made it. Okay. And in our final moments, as I see we're coming close to the end, I would think we wanted to each share one final example. This is one manuscript that I came to know very well at the Getty Museum, uh, one of our uh, Bibles, and I'm showing a scene from the Old Testament, in fact, in this manuscript. It's more than just the New Testament. Um, and you see there King David is dressed in uh, liturgical vestments that are similar to those worn by the Byzantine emperors centuries earlier, of course. Um, you see the manuscript binding with the wonderful stamps, uh, the leather at upper left, but on the back cover, which we see at uh, the inner back cover at upper right, we have this wonderful inscription uh, that praises God and provides an overview of his provisions for humankind. Uh, the scribe asks the Lord to receive the gift of hewn words, which he has hastened to complete. And he implores God to make the descendants of the illuminator heirs and to suckle them with milk of the wise, they who sit in the realm of the East, where the Holy One lived unharmed among the snakes. It's this wonderful Edenic paradisiacal image made for a community in New Jolfa. And there we see the text surrounded by these fragments of silk textile, which are likely contemporaneous textiles from uh, New Jolfa itself. And we had spoken about uh, various ways in which Armenians could have themselves created textiles to imitate the highest uh, cost textiles for the Safavids um, or any number of different patterns. Um, there was a whole market for these uh, patterns there uh, and the designs in New Jolfa. So this is a book uh, that is near and dear to my heart. And again, the illuminations across the over 600 pages are incredibly stunning. Every page features the kind of ornamental script and decoration that Hawk's work has helped us develop even more. But I think Sylvie, you have the showstopper manuscript for us. <laughs> Okay, so this is probably my all time favorite manuscript. It's at the Morgan and we have affectionately nicknamed it the bling bling binding. Um, this manuscript was certainly a miraculous or miracle working gospel book. These objects are, I believe, votive offerings made by people who were seeking help, uh, a cure for a disease or for a family member, or in thanks of prayers that were already answered. So either in anticipation of answered prayers or in thanks. You can see on the left, um, some earrings that someone has donated. The, the round things uh, around the cross are seal stones, very personal objects. They're not all Armenian. There were a couple ones in, there are a couple in Turkish and a couple in Persian and a few in Greek. So many people came to seek help from this important manuscript. And um, these were votive offerings and also protective amulets. Some of these uh, objects are uh, considered to be protective against the evil eye, et cetera, such as the uh, Mother of Pearl, um, which would also have been a votive offering, but Mother of Pearl is considered to protect against the evil eye. Okay, but the interesting thing regarding fabrics with this is that inserted into this manuscript were uh, about 25 pieces of um, uh, cloth. About eight of them were pieces of embroidery. I mentioned this earlier. I don't think they were really meant to be curtains. It's possible, but I think there were more votive offerings. Embroidery was something every girl learned and uh, was very important for her trousseau. And um, I think these were made as gifts to the manuscript. There are also bookmarks and plain muslin uh, inserts, plain white muslin inserts. And I don't know if those would be votive offerings too, but um, I, I believe these are, because some of them do, are just, um, they don't fit, they're way too big to, to be covering, for example, the uh, an image. And um, I think that's it for that one. Although I could talk for hours, but. <laughs> 
And so we wanted to thank, uh, well, I'm very grateful both to Sylvia and to Hawk for this incredible conversation, and we look forward to the workshop. Uh, we've very much benefited from the expertise and the collaboration of others. You've heard mentioned Rosemary Krill, Jennifer Weirden, Claire Brown, uh, Philip Sykes, Ariel Salzman, Sergio Laporta, De Getty, the Morgan, and the Institute for Advanced Study. And we're also, of course, grateful to Alexandra, Suzanne, and Sien, as well as uh, Melissa for organizing this wonderful workshop. Thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you in early May.